Hello, Julie. Hello, Sam, Karen, how are you doing? Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Charlie. Doing great, Good. and you? Very well, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here with you. Same. It's going to be amazing. So we're going to wait maybe just a few seconds. I can see that attendees are starting to come. And we start maybe in five seconds. <laughs> Just enough to uh, appreciate this cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> As a good Englishman. <laughs> Hi, Magali. <laughs> Hi. I can see that Adeline is also there. Hi, Adeline. <laughs> we have some beautiful people here today. <laughs> So maybe I'm going to start um, uh, while the other people uh, get connected. Um, so today uh, is a very special day for us because we're holding our very first uh, webinar with uh, one of our clients. Um, uh, everybody knows Charlie, but uh, we will uh, get there later and he will uh, get the opportunity to present uh, himself. Uh, so maybe just uh, a few words about uh, me, about Blunov and about uh, the webinar that we're having today. Um, so my name is uh, Tissam Shgoura. Uh, I'm a manager at Blunov. Um, I had the opportunity to lead the, the project Decathlon uh, along with uh, Karen, uh, whom you see on the screen, who is also a manager at Blunov. And um, uh, we are very happy to be hosting this webinar uh, and uh, also with our special guest, uh, Charlie Felgate, uh, who does us the immense honor of being present at our site. Um, and who is going to present himself in a few uh, seconds. So maybe just a few words about Blunov. So we are a technology and a consultant company. Uh, we were created in 2008 uh, and we pioneer massive collective intelligence uh, in France and uh, in Europe. And we are actively committed also in uh, civic technologies. Mm, so our mission is to help people, uh, public and private organization, uh, could create strategic and transformational plans and deploy collaborative approaches uh, on generally large scales uh, using methodology but also technology. Um, so uh, a few words maybe about why are we uh, hosting this uh, webinar and uh, why are we so proud today uh, to have in this webinar with Decathlon. Uh, because for us Decathlon was not uh, just another organization who wanted to launch uh, a co-creation program. Um, it's probably for us the best example uh, of a company that entirely embraced uh, the real meaning of collective intelligence. Um, they have integrated massive collective intelligence on such a large scale uh, and on a much larger scale than majority of organizations today. Um, and it wasn't just the deployment of uh, one methodology or one technology uh, and then letting it roll. Uh, it's um, it's an, a, a total embodiment and a true embodiment of a general approach all over the world and uh, at all the levels uh, of the company. So this is why we, we, we wanted to share uh, the, the Decathlon experience uh, with Charlie, uh, explaining it firsthand. Before I uh, give you the floor, Charlie, uh, I just want to say to all attendees that you have uh, a little question tab um, on the webinar. You can see that you have uh, on the interface a little question tab. Uh, do not hesitate to ask all the questions you want to ask. We have we will take a good 15 minutes um, of Q&A uh, with uh, Karen, with Charlie and with me. Uh, so you can ask your questions and we will uh, we'll do our best to answer the majority of the questions. OK, so Charlie, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, really, really happy to, to be with you all this morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's great to be with you this morning. And I'm delighted to be doing this in English, my native language. I am English. Uh, my name's Charlie Felgate. I'm 44 years old. I live in Lille, in northern France, which is where Decathlon's headquarters is based. And yes, we're going to talk about uh, Decathlon's journey of collective intelligence, but I'm also here from a, uh, from a personal perspective as well because I truly believe that each and every one of us has a role to play 
to making the world a better place. I truly believe that multinational companies have a huge role to play in contributing to a better world of tomorrow. So that's the role which I like, I intend to play within Decathlon, which, which is the vehicle within which I put my motor. So what I will do is share my screen. Hopefully this will work without problem. And if I go here and do this and click here, now you should all be able to see my screen. Is that okay? Can someone say yes? Because I yes, can't see perfect. you anymore. Perfect. Okay, so here we go. Let's begin. So my role at Decathlon is that of vision leader. And often get the question, what is a vision leader? Um, sounds really great, doesn't it? Someone who comes up with a vision. But uh, actually, my role is to drive uh, international, global, massive project of collective intelligence, because that is what we intend to do at Decathlon. We want to build our vision collectively. And if you want to find out more about me, don't hesitate to check me out on my LinkedIn page. Decathlon. So we are speaking in English today, and we have people from all over the world. Uh, obviously, French people know very well Decathlon. It's a company that has existed now for 44 years. We began in Lille, not too far from where I am here, and we sell sporting and leisure goods and have been for quite some time. Uh, since uh, about 20 years ago, uh, a bit more than that, we started making our own products, what we called our passion brands at the time. And now our sales of our own products make up about 88%. So we mostly sell our own stuff, which we design, which we uh, prototype, which we make, which we get to ship around the world and which we sell. Decathlon is, is gotten quite big in 2020. We have around 1,643 stores. One more, actually, because I opened one yesterday. We might talk about that later. We have 94,000 employees. We have a turnover which is getting quite, quite big at $12 billion. And we're present in 57 countries retailing and at five further countries uh, uh, in production. We actually produce in 25 different countries. And we make our products available to 400 million customers and users per year. And that's what we do. So our mission at Decathlon is to sustainably make the pleasure and benefits of sport accessible to the many. Now let's talk about vision now. And I'll talk about uh, collective intelligence from our past, what happened a few years ago, and where did we go from then? So the first thing to know about the Decathlon story is that collective intelligence is very much part of our DNA. Here we have an image of our founder, Michel Leclerc, who is uh, still alive and well today, fortunately. He created Decathlon 44 years ago. And when I took uh, my function as vision leader, I went to see Michel and I said, why is it important to have a vision? And he said, it's important to have a vision as soon as we become a group. It's what brings us together and it's what unites us. And this is even more important today. As I explained, 94,000 employees over 57 different countries. So it's very important that we have something that brings us together. And fortunately for Decathlon, we have always used collective intelligence to plot our vision. Michel Leclerc and his first team uh, over 40 years ago, we're already using collective intelligence. It started with a group of seven, which became 700 and then 7,000. And now we are 94,000. So we've always been fond of collective intelligence. And we use our vision as a beacon. You see on the top right there, it's the target. So we've always had the vision as our target. We must be ambitious when targeting that target. And once it's lit up, then what we do is to vise differentiating strategies and action plans in order to get there, which may well change along the way. So it often looks more like the line on the bottom than the line on the top. And Decathlon has been, been working in this way for a long time. Have a vision, make it known what it is, and then devise differentiating strategies to get there. But what is important is the action plan. What is important is the journey. What is important are the steps that we take as a team to get to that vision. So that's part of our past. 
Now, what happened with Vision 2026? So this was a huge exercise of uh, collective intelligence that took place four years ago now, in 2016. So in 2016, we did a 10-year um, vision, and we used collective intelligence on quite a massive scale. We actually got 37,000 employees involved, and we collectively created Vision 2026. We won't go through this, but we have different causes. And here, what was very important is that two of these causes out of five were about uh, CSR which we hadn't yet identified and written down as a clear strategic ambition. So we noticed that here, when you ask 37,000 people in your company what's important, unanimously they said the environment and respecting people. Uh, we knew this, but it hadn't been written down before. So we started to see the power of collective intelligence. So this exercise was good because it created high energy within our organization, 37,000 people contribute, contributed, and it gave rise to new strategies, uh, certainly for sustainability. But um, I, we observed, and I observed, uh, a few problems with this. Uh, firstly, there was relatively low adoption from certain leaders in the company. Uh, I personally felt it was, it was too ego-focused. This was all about us what we want for you in many ways. So where is the voice of the stakeholders in that? And personally, what really bothered me was this huge uh, lack of alignment between what I heard people saying and what they would do the next day. So we would organize these workshops of collective intelligence and the people would come in, dozens and hundreds of people, and we'd listen to them and they talk about what they want for the future of their company and what's important for them, really, you know, de delivering from their guts and their heart what they really wanted. And the next day, they'd go back to work and do something completely different. So where's this alignment between the person and the job? And in many ways, I can and bring this down to, to one thing, is that there's this contrast between two types of mentality. One is, uh, if the roof ain't broke, don't fix it. Everything's fine. And uh, decathlon is a model that works pretty well and still works pretty well. So, you know, why change it? And then you've got this other more oriental philosophy is you need to fix the roof while the sun is shining. So this is also the short term against the long term. But we're all in it for the long term, right? We all know that the world is changing. Even in 2016, we felt the VUCA uh, phenomenon coming. And yet, things were going fine. So there was little movement for change. Which now brings us to our story, to massive online collective intelligence. Now, this story began for me in November 2018 almost two years ago now, where I took my function as vision leader. Now, I knew in my heart, pretty much on my own, that what I wanted to do was to open the scope of collective intelligence to everybody, not just some, not just customers, not just uh, uh, suppliers, but everyone. Um, if we believe in collective intelligence, then you need to integrate the voice of all your stakeholders. That, that, was, that was what I wanted to do. And that's what, speaking to many colleagues, I found out that many of us wanted to do. And if you remember well, November 2018 in France, we had this thing called the Le Grand Débat. So for those of you who are outside of France, who maybe don't know this, our uh, French president, Emmanuel Macron, he wanted to ask the French people, quite simply, what do you want? And they launched this huge national debate about what French people expect and what they want. And of course, you can't do that um, physically. You can do it physically. He did do that physically, but you need to do it digitally. So I saw this Grand Debat, and I looked into who was working on that, and that's how I discovered Blue Nove. So this led us to work on Vision 2030, which began over a year ago on the left-hand side of you of your screen. I presented that to the company very much. This is what we're going to do. I need a team of people to help. And like-minded people and people who wanted change, they got on board. 
So I created what we call a core team of people, uh, 25 people, a couple of them are on this webinar, hi guys, to, to help me out with that. These are people who are internal, these are people who are external, and these are people who are freelance. And we built the, the methods and the process for our Vision 2030 exercise, which is based on Theory U. We began last September, a year ago, with, with co-inspiration. We chose three themes, because what's going on in the world is a pretty wide thing. So we chose to study three things, the future of people, the future of sports people, and the future of living. And we did that on a very macro scale over a few months, using the platform of collective intelligence from the month of October. From January of this year, we began the second phase, which is co-exploring. Co-exploring means that we analyze the data that we had received from the macro co-inspiring session um, in order to go deeper into what's important for people with regards to decathlon. And then what we were supposed to do in April of this year was to co-write the Vision 2030 of Decathlon at seven hundred, several hundred people physically and then deliver it for the month of June. That was the plan. So in order to do that, we had to go further. Coffee and post-its can only go so far. We still do coffee and post-its but we needed to create digital platforms of collective intelligence. And this is where Blue Nove came into play. So um, this, the platform in the middle is what uh, Blue Nove created, vision2030.decathlon.com, which you can still visit. Uh, I had a, uh, what we call a, um, a front site, Decathlon Vision 2030, to explain what we were going to do. And, that, and we had our social media channels as well, because we were truly committed to opening this exercise to all of our stakeholders. And what happened? Well, we had our three subjects, future of people, sports people and living, and we had over 25,000 inputs that went into our vision platform. Now that's a lot more than 25,000 people because very often you had several people around a smartphone or around a computer putting the inputs into the platform because we believe in collective intelligence and and ideas become richer when people work in small clusters and from that point we have uh gave birth to four exploration territories and this was all about to, this was all about talking about what we want for the lives of tomorrow and to bring that to life we asked people to imagine a story of tomorrow this was one of the later parts of the process, getting people to write stories. And we actually received 1,115 stories from people all over the world, uh, Decathlon teammates and people from outside of the company. And I think that if we got people from outside the company involved, it's because the questions changed. If you want to embark on true global collective intelligence, the question which you do not ask is, what will Decathlon be in 10 years? Because quite frankly, people don't care. People don't care about making you still alive in 10 years. It's not the question. The question is, what do you want the world to be in 10 years time? What are you expecting from anybody, companies, governments, institutions? And then what role do you, the stakeholder want us to play in that world that you want to live in. And right at the end of the very process, we can ask the question, within that world, what could Decathlon become? And this was a real shift in paradigm for us. Here you have a photo of the first training we gave to 60 people which took part in Lille. These are people from all over the world, mostly Decathlon employees, but not only. We have external people as well. And these are what we call our vision relays because the vision process is nothing if you don't have people in place in our 57 countries deploying the project locally and not on a national scale, but on a city scale. And when we say open to all, it was truly open to all. And just a few photos, some of my favorites. We went to retirement homes in Poland. Underneath, that's a supplier who make the brakes for your mountain bikes called Tektro in Taiwan. Underneath, we have the University of Saigon. We have Olga 
giving an atelier, a workshop of collective intelligence in her swimming club, in the swimming pool. Great place to do it. Bottom photo, we have Nathan in a primary school in Ghent, not too far from here. And we have our teammates, uh, top right in Colombia and bottom right, the last physical workshop that took place on the 9th of March of this year in Paris. And all of a sudden, Vision 2021 was born because you know what happened in March. And we felt that because we were running an international project, it already began for us with China in January, and then it followed in Italy in February. And this caused us to reconsider and to really become aware of what was going on in our project. As I said earlier, we were supposed to write in April and to deliver in June, but we didn't. We took some time to look at what was going on. We took some time to feel and to listen to what was going on. And what we also did was Blue Nose, was that we separated the type of data before March and then from March. Obviously, from the 1st of March, when lockdown started to come into place, we saw a sharp rise in the number of contributions because all of a sudden people were doing introspection, thinking about what they really want, what is essential for me today, which really helped us with our process of collective intelligence. And we decided to rebaptize Vision 2030 to Vision 2021. And it was, it was a very organic, it was an easy decision to make because we noticed that COVID-19 has already accelerated the pace of change. And that we can no longer have the time to wait to apply vision dreams to local action. Because what we observed was that within, uh, uh, notification, sorry about that. So what we observed was that people who had been dreaming of 2030 and giving us their ideas for 2030, what happened was after people were still giving us the same ideas, but they didn't want them for 2030 anymore. They wanted them for vision 2021. So we, just, we saw that we had a window of opportunity now to make some serious systemic change. Because at the end of the day, this exercise is not about imagining what the future will be. It's always been about driving change and making sure that we achieve our transformation from a company of yesterday to a company of tomorrow. So we decided to bring it forward and call it Vision 2021. Now it's called Decathlon Vision, version 21.1. I can't give you the results today, but I can tell you that the themes are very much about health, mobility, inclusivity, being transparent, about being regenerative, and about being focused on local living. And it's called Decathlon Vision version 21.1 because from now on, we intend to enter into the era of the permanent vision. And maybe before the end of the year, we will have Decathlon Vision V21.2, and maybe we will have Decathlon Vision V22 in the beginning of 2021, which I'm sure we will have. So that's a very quick overview of what we've done with this project. Thank you very much for listening. And what I shall do is to stop sharing my screen and yes. pass you back to Vitsam. Yes, <laughs> thanks, Charlie. Thanks for this uh, uh, overview of uh, the Decathlon project. Um, uh, we didn't dive uh, very much into the process uh, and um, every step that happens, and also the challenges that were uh, that you faced, guys, and that we faced together uh, uh, along the road, uh, methodolog methodological, technical, etc. And um, this also is part, I think, of, of the path. But um, do not hesitate. Actually, uh, I'm asking the, the, the people uh, who are attending to ask questions on the question tab. You can ask questions in French or in English. Uh, do not hesitate. So, yeah, I have a question for you, Charlie, to maybe uh, uh, keep uh, describing the project. Um, how, would you, how did you actually measure the impact uh, of such a huge project? Well, the, the, the impact will, become, will be measured through local actions. It's all very well to go on this journey and to have these 
five axes of a vision. But the 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 as my grandmother used to say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and not the cooking. So we've done the cooking, we had a recipe, and now we have a beautiful cake. And we're just about to go on, go to the table and eat it. And this leads us into the last phase. And the last phase will be co-evolve. So for those of you who are familiar with the theory U, as we come up the outside of the, of the U, then we have to start crystallizing and prototyping uh, vision into action. And this will be the true measure. So the final step of the vision is not saying, this is the vision, we worked on it, it's great. It's okay, now what we're going to do is to help you with a methodology in order to co-evolve. How to translate these actions into local actions. And that's what we will start doing from the month of September. But our job in the vision team is to, to provide the methods and the tools in order for people to do that locally. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, and also, we, when we talk about impact, uh, surely one, one of the most important parts is the human part, and it's also the engagement, because you talked about it, you had a core team that was amazing, and then you had all these people uh, involved in the project, but um, how do you intend uh, to keep this incredible engagement around the project, uh, both in the internal and the external ecosystem for the months or the years to come? Yes. Well, this this question is the this the key question. It's the key question, and it was actually our starting point. So we start with that question two years ago, because it, it's 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 vital. How do you keep that engagement now? And that's why we embark on global massive collective intelligence, because one of the ways to engage people is to make the vision their vision. So if it's a top-down vision written by a few people, then why would I appropriate that as my vision? Why would I adopt that as my vision? It's nothing to do with me. So this is why we, we went on that journey of massive global collective intelligence. We've never done that with external stakeholders before. It's been a learning by doing process. So we will know if we have complete engagement by creating local actions, creating projects, which involve those stakeholders which took part. And but what is key in engagement is really being true to what people said. To do what you say and to say what you do. There is no bullshit allowed here at all. There's no cheating. And once you go embark on, uh, on this transparent global collective intelligence, everything that has been said has been open. Anybody has been able to read what people want. And now we, ne we need to, to make that happen in the way that people said that they wanted it to happen. And there's, and you can't cheat on that. So the first thing is to start with the question, get people involved in order to, for them to appropriate and to adopt the vision as themselves in order to, in to, to make it happen. Get them involved, co-create, co-build, co-involve everyone. The, the, for me in companies, where everybody talks about storytelling, it's finished storytelling. Story living is the way forward. How can you get your stakeholder to be a part of your future. And uh, many companies have realized this, we've realized this, and we want to get people, anybody who wants to, who share our vision, share our values on board to co-create our future. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, and uh, Keren, uh, now I have a qu one question for you, maybe. it's uh, we, we, we talked about the core team, and uh, it was an amazing core team, we know that, um, that uh, had the opportunity to work on the project. But um, how did you, how did the two teams actually work together, the Blue Nav team and, um, and uh, the Catalan team? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, it's very interesting because it really resonates what Charlie just said about collective intelligence and hear everyone and not just story tell, but story live. And that's exactly what happened within the two teams. Uh, they didn't want just us to come as um, a simple um, uh, methodology and tool uh, partner, but as a true partner within the team overall, uh, they really wanted us to coach them about collective intelligence methods and tools. And they were able to really take on all that we had to share, which created something that was really special and really useful for the project. 
they had a motto that was trust the people and trust the process. So it was really backwards. It was either for us or for them. It was one integrated team. There are no miracles on how you can work in a collective intelligence manner. And that's what happened. And I think that's what made the project so special and also so successful. Thank you very much. So, um, if you are uh, if you are okay with that, we maybe uh, can have fifteen minutes on the questions because there are very interesting questions that we're uh, we're starting to have here. Um, so maybe I'm going to start with a question for you, Charlie. Um, we have many questions about. Uh, the motivation or the incentives actually. So how did you incentivize people to take part inside or outside Decathlon? And uh, we have a galaxy of little questions about the motivation uh, for people to participate both inside and outside Decathlon. Yeah, so it's a great question. Why would I get involved with this? Well, mm -hmm. um, when you look at the core team, the people who I worked on this, we all have something very strongly in common, and that is a strong desire to change the world for the better. Now, there's very few people who would disagree with that. Who wouldn't? Who does not want a better word, better world? Sorry, for their children. Um, but in any organisation, and I often quote um, Mark Elevy, if you take a hundred people in an organisation, uh, you'll see that twenty percent of people are really positive and really, really want to get on board. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, twenty percent of people are, you know, detractors and and will probably really not want to get in board and probably cause trouble for you. 60% are on the fence in the middle. So our job is to really identify that 20% who are really uh, on board, who really want change. And that's what my focus is. Identify that 20% who are really for this. And together, collectively, our common task becomes we, as a team of 20 percenters, need to get on board as many of those 60 percent who are on the fence as possible. I would never and I and I would never spend energy saying I need to get everybody on board. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So and, and, and personally, I distance myself from from negative energy. I, I don't need that. So I'm going to spend time with the positive people and collectively we try and get as many people on board as possible. But it's not for everybody. Sometimes people are just too busy. Sometimes people aren't comfortable with that. Sometimes it scares people and that's okay. And our job is to uh, accompany those people. And when they're ready to get on board, we'll be ready for them. Um, externally, it's a slightly different story because they really do need a reason to get involved. There's some there's 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 Magali who's who's on the on the webinar here. You, you, we could ask her why did she get involved, uh, but um, generally you have to ask the right questions. So the right questions are if we all believe that multinational companies can change the world, we believe that too. So let's try and think about what we can do together to make the world a better place. So the methodology which we put into place, which by the way we'll make available to any company who wants to know open to all transparency. Um, we don't believe that we have all the answers. We, this was untried and untested before. Uh, we gave it a go. It seemed to work. Uh, what we do know is that the method worked all around the world. And it worked because you ask people as individuals what they want and don't don't talk to them as customers, as, an, as employees. Just talk to them as, as humans. We're all here today. We're all human beings above and beyond whatever title we have within our company. Perfect. Thank you very much. I will. Uh, um, I will jump to another question that's very interesting. Uh, it's also for you, Charlie. Uh, that says from Guillaume: the purpose of a long-term target is that it should drive energies and people to go further and beyond. That's what a normal journey would uh, would lead them. Therefore, uh, is the 2021 vision still enough ambition, ambitious, sorry, and dream-oriented? Good question. Now, recently, Decathlon changed uh, its, uh, no, we re-clarified our purpose, which our purpose is now to be useful to people and to the planet, which is the overriding umbrella, to be useful to the people and to the planet. So for me, this is, this is the eternal North Star now. Now, collective intelligence is brilliant because it really does bring people together to talk and to discuss and think about what we want. And it may have the downside of not being ambitious enough as we look to the future. So on a parallel, I have commissioned 
uh, through a series of experts uh, the future of sport in 50 years time, which is very, very technical and very in-depth. And through that uh, very technical expert type of document, you, you get the sort of things that way, way, may well be missing. I will also add that if your if your parti pris, I love that word in French. If your parti pris is collective intelligence on a massive scale, then you can't expect people to really understand what is really going to happen in ten years, and it's it can be pretty scary. I mean, it, you you read things today about Neuralink, what Elon Musk is going about connecting our brains to the cloud, which sounds like science fiction, but in science fiction there is science. So we're well aware of all this, but when you undergo um, a 10-year vision in this way, what you end up with is a very humanist and emotional vision. So it's less technical, less digital. We are very technical and digital, but in our strategies and not necessarily in our vision. But indeed, it's, it's a change of the paradigm for us, and we'll see where that takes us. Great, thank you. Um, we have uh, another question from Nicola. Uh, it's also for you, Charlie, I think. Uh, how do you orchestrate the action plan resulting from Vision 2021? Um, and what KPIs did you agree with the Decathlon executive leaders for the rollout? So that's going to happen in the next few months. So when we deliver the vision, what we will deliver is the vision and the methodology. It's then up to each leader to go through this and to create local actions locally. So all of those KPIs will be done locally. Now, there's no global KPIs for the vision. There are KPIs for strategies, which are written by our DG, or uh, whatever you call them in English, uh, executive committee. Now, but for the vision, remember, we're present in 57 different countries. And what is true in Ghana is not necessarily true in Dublin or in Manila or in Montreal. So this is why we have a, a, a range of targets which we can go towards and leaders can choose the ones which mean the most to them. But KPIs are related to projects, projects related to action, and the action is related to the vision. But if you're in Decathlon, the vision is part of who we are. We have our purpose, our mission, our values, and our vision. It's what we call the framework. And each leader is expected to play within that framework of which the vision is part of. But what they decide to do, they will decide to do locally what makes sense for them. Great, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question maybe about what you said about um, what's happening in Ghana is not necessarily uh, the same that what's going to be in Poland or something like that. Uh, so uh, there is a question about um, how did you deal with the lack of consensus on a few dimensions of the vision? with difficulty <laughs> yeah lack of consensus this is the thing so what we yeah. did we basically went from what forty thousand inputs to the you guys blue note you made the synthesis and then over a two-day period with my core team big up core team and myself we we worked in a 48-hour hackathon mode to to take that data and make five coherent sentences. So it took us 48 hours to do that. So we had to go through two filters. The first filter was the summary, which was written by Blue Nove, which is the synthesis is what's been written by all of these people from all around the world. And then on the second level, something which is due to me, I like Simon Sinek quite a lot. And in his latest book, The Infinite Game, he talks about what is a just cause. And he puts these five criteria, what is a just cause? So we use this as a filter to write that. Then, once we had those five causes, which we actually had six, I would that we then embarked on two months, two months of showing, presenting, lobbying, going, showing it in India, showing it in Italy, getting a feeling. I, I did a survey of 300 people from Decathlon and 700 external people. So a thousand people had a look into it. And then we managed to change a couple of words here and there. But it's not easy because, uh, as we say in French, uh, choisir c'est renoncer. When you choose something, it means that you're not saying something else. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a, an interesting question from Dominique uh, who asks, nowadays, sun is not shining and yet roofs are not fixed. Uh, fear and low investment, probably. So what would 
be your main ad advice, a recommendation and priority for companies in a, in a difficult situation uh, for them to carry out successful collective intelligence projects? Well, it's the best time to do it um, and do it now and do it quickly. Do it quick and dirty if you must do it. The, the conditions are ripe. Um, systemic change often hasn't happened, but all those reasons that you have just cited puts us in a position of back against the wall innovation. And sometimes you see, you see that the companies who have really achieved really good change over the last two decades are those which were in big trouble. I'm a very big fan of Lego. Look at the history of Lego, which is a great success today, but almost on two occasions from 2000 to 2010, they nearly died. So they had to transform radically. So obviously this is a situation which is very difficult for very many companies. And it's exactly the moment to stop thinking in the way you've been thinking change the paradigm, open up the, uh, these, the walls to your company, be transparent within your organization and start having a conversation with your stakeholders. Start with your employees if you need to, open up the boundaries. And what's really interesting for businesses is that businesses tend to listen to their company. Uh, sorry, businesses tend to listen to their customers. It's been the case for years. The customer is king. I mean, that, that's changed a little bit over the time, but it's still there. People often listen to their customers. And if customers are saying, hey, guys, we think you should do this, this, and this, then maybe there's a good chance of actually making that systemic change that you've been trying to do so much over the last couple of years. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for you, Karen. It's um, it was how do you, how did you experience working with the, one of the most advanced teams on managerial innovation? Uh, that that's a question that's also uh, for the Catalan. You know, <laughs> it's, it's for you, Karen. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, it was a personally, it was a great experience because they they were uh, at the level of their reputation and above. Uh, they have shown how it's how important it is to be adaptable and in a state of continuous innovation. Uh, they have evolved, as Charlie said, with the context and with the information that they had, and they were able to be uh, very quick and very efficient in taking decisions, in agree all together and lead a project in such a significant way. Uh, and I think that also their ability to quickly take ownership of the method and the tool in order to pivot to 2021 uh, what was what was the most impressive to me? Thank you, and I, I can also you know uh, say that uh, um, generally when we when you have uh, uh, when you have a consultant a company like Bruno, you expect uh, the consultants to do everything, and this is absolutely not the Decathlon way. So the, the Decathlon way also is uh, to to be uh, to embody uh, the the change they want to see and to do uh, things also themselves because this is uh, this is how it changes uh, the company from the inside, and this is something uh, you know we, I, I can I can testify for that too and it brings us to another question that's on the on the chat um, from christian who actually asks a question about how does vision actually change or influence actual changes in the Catalan? well hugely absolutely hugely uh, if we go back to the last vision exercise two sustainability strategies were born they were uh, sorry they were just they, that was vision it was like okay now we need to take care of our in, environment and that went from there, that went to measuring our impact on a very deep scale. You know, we know it's 11 million tons of CO2. We know in detail what our environmental and societal impact is. And from th that point, when you've measured it, we say, okay, this isn't good enough. We know that 80% of our CO2 emissions are linked to production. Let's work on that now. Let's in uh, not only intend and write, we're going to reduce our CO2 by 50% by 2026, but we put into place serious action plans which are validated by science-based targets. It's not just writing in a, in a nice document. So it, it changes hugely. And, and that last exercise, we changed our mission. Our mission before was to make uh, uh, the pleasure and benefits of sport accessible to all. We actually added a word to sustainably make the pleasure and benefits of sport accessible to all. So vision has a huge power. It starts as dreams, and then it works its way into strategy and into action plans. And uh, we are very, 
very much i'm i'm really a surprise so surprised to see where we are today that we have a million miles to go to make decathlon uh, a sustainable company but the the progress in four years is great um today we only have 500 products which are eco design but by 2026 100 percent of decathlon products will be eco designed and that comes from vision Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, we have a question from Nicola who asks, did your, um, uh, it's also, it's, it, the, this question is about uh, the fact that you talked uh, earlier about the, 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 the power or the role that the big multinational corporations can have on changing the world and the fact that we believe in that. Um, so the question is, did, do you think that collective intelligence at multiple company level is possible, building together a vision with several companies involved? It's not just possible, but it's absolutely essential. And, th and this takes us into the area of regeneration, because uh, sustainable development as we see it, and as many companies see it, is just doing less bad. But when do we start doing good? We'll start doing good when we start looking at this as a, as a systemic, holistic approach. Because if you look at clothing and apparel, something that we'll which we're involved in, the problems in H&M and Nike are the same as ours. The problem with scarcity of water is the problem, the same problem everywhere. So absolutely, to make some serious change in the world, then companies have to start working together. And here, um, I, I will honestly admit that one of my biggest regrets in this vision process was I did not do enough to get Nike involved or to get adidas involved and, and i regret that and um if they're listening let, let's do something together because competition from yesterday is not is not today's competition competition today is ignorance it's malnutrition it's it's not doing enough it's too much sugar it's netflix it's it's sitting down too much anything which stops you from doing sport is competition so let's come together and work with tesla and ng and edf so collective intelligence between companies is the way forward we, we've got to do it we've got to do it because we can't do this by ourselves okay so we hope that we have nike or adidas in the, in the crowd and they they can they can join you a later on that um there, there was a question about uh, the impact of the collective intelligence exercise on the governance of the company. How did you uh, commit and what was the role of the executive committee in this journey? So there's governance and executive committee. Yeah. Question. This is key because if we um, have gotten this far, it's because I, uh, we have the, um, the total and full support of the company CEO. In fact, I work directly with the company CEO for this project. The company CEO is responsible for the vision, and I'm the operational side of that. So he's the spiritual side of that. But we, and together we incarnate the project, incarnate the project, embody the project. So the CEO, I said to him, look, I want to do this massive global collective intelligence, but I really want to go outside the company. We're going to have to be mega transparent on this. And he said, yeah, great. Sounds good. Let's go. I repeated it three times to really make sure that he understood my French. And uh, of course, I, I had his full support. We talked to the shareholders about that. Great conversation. Uh, the president supported that fully. And we actually had a special session in January involving our shareholders. So it was, it was important for us to get them involved in this exercise. The same exercise that everybody around the world that was doing, that they, they were doing as well. So that was a good way to get them involved. Now, I won't pretend that everything's easy. You know, I, I, I appreciate that listening to me think, oh, Decathlon's great, Decathlon this. There is, there are many people that don't really agree with, with everything I've said. There are many managers at Decathlon who don't really give much worth to what I'm saying right now. And this is the difficulty because middle managers are often uh, in control of hundreds or thousands of people. So they need to be involved as well. So top management isn't necessarily the problem that I experienced. It's, it's definitely uh, the middle management was a bit of a harder challenge for us. But in any event, top level buy-in from C-suite executives 
and your CEO is vital if you are to push this. And they have to mean it. You have to mean it, CEOs. You can't pretend and do it just because it's trendy, because people will feel that and they won't get on board. Well, thank you very much for that. I will take maybe just the last two questions. The first one was, um, did you put anyhow the organization at risk with uh, the collective intelligence method and uh, with the vision, or was it a non-risk decision? Can you say a bit more about that? Yes. Um, I remember when I started talking about doing this internally, and of course, um, certain services says, oh, that's a risk. That's a risk. Going open going transparent oh you know people will maybe repeat stuff on twitter oh uh there's all these amazing ideas and anybody in the world will be able to read that so people were pointing out the risks to me now i don't consider them risks because i believe that you cannot receive unless you give first i believe that there's more to gain by sharing and being openly transparent there than there is to lose. Obviously, we were not going to put our financial accounts on our uh, intelligence platform. There's no need for that. And we were not going to put our latest patents that we hadn't had yet legally validated. I mean, that's not what it's all about. It's just people coming together, talking about what they want for the future. And if your competitors want to come along, then that's great. That's great. Let's, let's do this together. Let's do it together. So there were risks which certain people outlined, but we did it anyway, not really knowing where it was going. And there was no bad buzz on Twitter. And there was no, oh, look what they're doing. That's, that's a load of crap. And we, I think there was, it was very much widely appreciated because, because it was so transparent. So that was my experience with Decathlon. Okay, and the last question is more personal. So uh, we have uh, a question for you that, that says, what did you, Charlie, learn with this project personally? I learned to trust more. Trust more. Um, I, I felt that I was a, a quite a trustworthy manager, but we really had a lot of things where we didn't know where we we're going. I learned to say, it's okay to say, I don't know. And that I will continue because these projects are new and you don't really know where they're going to go. And you don't really know what, what this collective intelligence is going to throw up. And as a leader, it's okay in 2020 to say, I don't know. Agility and resilience are two characteristics that we need to embrace. Controlling, we've got to let go. We've got to let go of yesterday. The models of the future are not the same as today. So personally, I learned to delegate more, to trust more, and to be really okay with that famous three words, I don't know. That's super. Uh, maybe I'm going to take this last one uh, because we still have uh, more than 100 people with us. So um, maybe just the last question about how did you convince your board to invest in a non-immediately uh, uh, return on investments action process in such hard times i didn't convince them i just did it so you we were talking um, about it five minutes before the <laughs> webinar actually yes <laughs> yeah i didn't um i didn't ask i just did it convinced that it was the right thing to do and i think we should be doing more of the right thing to do within companies that's not necessarily advice and it's uh, your decision if you want to do that within your organization but uh, I took that risk on a personal level, and um, I have no regrets. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. Thank you, Karen. Uh, it was really uh, nice hearing all again about it. Uh, it's uh, We never grow tired of this project and talking about it. So um, for all the people who are still here, uh, we are going, I think, to have the replay uh, also, uh, if you want to share it with the other people, if you found it interesting. And uh, again, thank you very, very much uh, for all the questions. And, um, and thank you, Charlie, for your answers and your presence. Thank you, Karen, too. Thank you for everyone. Thanks for Thank listening. You. Thanks for your questions. Don't hesitate to uh, uh, connect to, yeah. to to LinkedIn. And if there's any other questions, I'll be happy to, the, to reply to them uh, at a later time. Okay. Okay. So see you all. Yes. <laughs> bye -bye. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, everyone. Have a bye -bye. good day. Bye-bye.